we were looking at some of the different types of intervals that you could have in sound and one of the most important intervals is that between the fundamental and the octave. Now, that relationship can be expressed in any key if that's what you are a musician they usually refer to keys but that really means that the fundamental can be any particular sound can be any particular frequency in this case we're going to just start with the frequency 440 that's an a4 as far as a musician is concerned 440 hertz an octave up from that is just double the frequency so 8080 is its octave so let's listen to both of those different uh, sounds in this pure data patch that i've set up here if I just turn on my compute audio and then put my pure data patch into uh, run mode and then I can start playing. That's the 440 frequency, so that's A4 and the octave. Now there's a very strong relationship between those two frequencies and it doesn't matter what the fundamental is, that is what's the first note here, it could be 440, it could be 320, as long as the second note, the octave, is twice the frequency. In isolation, just by themselves, sometimes it's hard to recognize that that very, very basic type of jump from a low fundamental to an octave above it is used quite a lot. It's a very, very strong structure in music as well. And to give you some examples of well-known tunes, uh, here's a few of them. Starting with Somewhere Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. And just listening to that again. If I go to my piano scale here, my uh, FM8, I can tally with what uh, Judy Garland was singing in that song. Uh, it starts with a G sharp, and it goes up an octave to the G sharp above that. And then it continues on through the rest of the song. That's what it looks like on a piano keyboard, but what does it look like in terms of mimicking that sound in pure data? Well, if I go to my... Uh, list of different notes versus frequencies uh, that's been given to you on Blackboard in Lab 1. If I scan down and look for the note G4, G sharp, G sharp, which is this note here, it's saying that that is a frequency of 415 hertz 0 0.3. So 415 hertz we'll round that down to. And then I can go back to pure data. I will turn on my sound. And then moving in, I will take this frequency down to 415. I don't need to look at the what the octave note is on my chart of different notes because I know the octave will be twice 415, which is 830. So I'm just tuning that up. And then let's try and play the first two notes of that somewhere over the rainbow and see what it sounds like. Somewhere. Turning off my sound, I will just go back to Judy Garland again and let's see how it sounds. Does it mimic it? And pure data. So you can see that octave in that song, very, very simple. Uh, it's just a doubling of the frequency. And again, just to show you what that looks like if we were to represent it using a sine wave diagram. This is what it looks like. We have the fundamental, in our case a G sharp, or a frequency of 415 hertz. And the octave is just double the frequency, meaning that we get twice as many waves in the same amount of time. So I can see the octave in red there. And that's the relationship. Now, let's look at some other well-known songs that also use this octave relationship between some kind of note and then an octave above it, so doubling the frequency. Another good one is Singing in the Rain from the musical Singing in the Rain, really well known. Uh, let's just have a listen to it. I'm singing. So, just that small little snippet from I'm singing up an octave. So, if we go to our keyboard, we can see that that is a C sharp up to the octave. And again, let's just do that in pure data so we get to see what the frequencies are. So I've picked out C sharp here, C sharp 4, it's 277 hertz, and we can just go straight into pure data and fill in the blanks here. I'll bring this down to 277, 
and I'm going to then turn on the sound. So that's the C sharp, and I can see it kind of tallies with what the song was that I heard there a second ago. I'm going to go up here to the um, octave at the first one I had it set to 830, but now it's going to be just twice 277, which is 554. Now as I get down to 554, we'll hear it coming closer to a very strong relationship between this low C sharp here. Let me just turn it up a little bit. So that's a C sharp. I'm going to come down to 5. 554. As soon as I came it, I, was, I even forgot what the number was. I forgot what the number was, but as soon as I had passed it, I realized I had passed it because of that really strong relationship with it. Again, if I ramp that up a little bit, come back to the fundamental. I don't even have to look at it. I can kind of sense where it's about to... There. So again, that's twice 277554. Turn off the audio on that. Let's have another listen to it on the, uh, the music. And so there you have it, singing in the rain. Now, while I'm here in pure data, I'm really only just using this number box here and this number box here. The number box in the middle, I'm saving in for a different interval that I'm going to speak about later on. But for the moment, I'm just going to comment these two. And I can call this the root or the fundamental. The two terms are interchangeable. Okay. That's fine. Um, and so that looks good. So I've got my root, or what's also called the fundamental. I can use those both terms uh, interchangeably, or I've got an octave here as well. And the middle one I'll label later on. Let's look at some other songs. And the more songs I play, the less detail I'm going to go into in terms of picking out the different fundamentals and the octaves, because soon you'll be able to just recognize this kind of interval uh, in all of these songs yourself. Next up is a very famous Christmas song, Let It Snow. Let's have a listen. And again, just that octave, the first note. Oh, the weather. That interval there is an octave. And once more. So that's another. Here we go with another Christmas one, the Christmas song that's made famous by Nat King Cole. I think it's written by Mel Torme. So. Chestnuts wrote. Again, another octave there. Last one I'm going to take for you here is uh, the really famous song Bally High from Rodgers and Hammerstein's uh, musical uh, South Pacific. So just that interval there. So just that interval there. So that's an octave as well. And again, all I'm doing here is just uh, showing you that it's quite recognizable on all of these different tunes. It's used a huge amount. I'm just picking out some really basic type of examples that usually happen at the beginning of the songs. Now I'd like to go on and talk about the perfect fifth interval. And first of all, I'm going to set uh, my root and my octave back to 440 and 880, and that will match in with this 60, 60 here. And in terms of Western type of music that we'd all be used to, uh, we already looked at the root and the octave relationship, but the next kind of most common kind of relationship that's very, very strong, very, very solid is this perfect fifth. Again, we're calling it a perfect fifth because that's what really music musicians call us, calls it. But uh, let's look at what it looks like on a sine wave chart. So the sine wave chart of a perfect fifth is in this case, the uh, fundamental of the root is again the red wave um, and that is C, a fifth up from that in music is a G. So the way that that works out in the frequencies is that uh, two or one and a half times the uh, G note will fit inside one iteration of the C note or one wavelength of the C note. So the, uh, the ratio between the different waves is three is to two. And if you think of a bit of it uh, in terms of the octave and root relationship, the octave was just you could fit in two octave waves inside one of a wave of the fundamental. With this perfect fifth, you can actually just fit in one and a half times the wave inside one wave of the, the root. 
So it's the next strongest type of match in terms of waves locking into each other um, that we have after the octave. Let's listen to it inside PD and see what it sounds like. Turning on my sound and just starting to play these different notes by putting it into run mode. So I've got the root, I've got the octave. Now let's lo listen to this middle ground here, this 660 here. So again, a very, very strong relationship between those different notes. That uh, that interval between the actual root and the perfect fifth, again, is very, very recognizable. Just play it one more time. And let's listen to some really common tunes that use that so that we'd be able to recognize it. Now, firstly, we've got Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So just those first two notes there, that's going from the root to the perfect fifth. So it's the root to a perfect fifth. Let's kind of see what that looks like on a keyboard. So in that key that they were playing it there, that's a C sharp, I think. Okay, and then let's go and see, can we mimic that in pure data? Looking at the C sharp on the... Uh, conversion between different musical notes and frequencies. I can see C sharp is 277, so I think we've played with that one before. Uh, let's just go back to pure data now. And uh, I'm going to change it down to 277. That's fine. And also, I want to get a perfect fifth. Now, if we can do the maths of this without actually looking forward and looking at the actual note on the uh, note of frequencies. Again, I'm saying that I can fit in one and a half times uh, a perfect fifth wave inside the uh, root wave. So if a root wave is 277, essentially the perfect fifth interval, the note for that will be one and a half times 277. Just quickly getting out a calculator and uh, calculating that, so 1.5 times by 277 gives me around one or 415 uh, to 416. So I'm just going to get in here and see can I Um, four, four fifteen, four fifteen, four sixteen, kind of area. So let's play those two, and that matches. Again, let's play it on YouTube. So that sets it up, and that kind of proves what the uh, the relationship is. Let's look at some other kind of really common songs or common tunes, recognizable themes that use this kind of uh, fundamental rouge to uh, perfect fifth type of relationship. A very good example that actually brings in the octave as well. And again, just the octave of these uh, root perfect fifth and octave two seven seven four sixteen. This should be down to uh, five five four. Uh, is the Star War themes. So the Star War theme, let's take a listen. So just that very recognizable spacey kind of epic and let's listen how that looks in uh, in pure data. It just happens to be the same key so I don't need to change it. So again, uh, we might need some imagination to kind of get this tally but what we just heard on YouTube but the root is uh, And there we have it, my really bad impression of the Star Wars team, but we can see that it tallies on with what we're seeing here. So that root, perfect fifth octave, because the waves match into each other so, so well in terms of the different ratios, it's a very, very strong type of uh, interval that an awful lot of composers use, especially what I said in class was, Anytime composers want to get this epic, spacey feel, they often use this type of interval. And just to show you examples of that, let's look at some other types of uh, themes that are often used in spacey kind of themes. A great one is the Superman theme.
And again, if I just set up my pure data, it's in the key of C. So the fundamental is the C, and that is 262 roughly. So if I go down into my pure data, and we'll just set this up. 262 is the 524 is twice 262, so that's the octave. And then the perfect fifth is one and a half times that, so that's 393. Let's uh, turn on our audio. Let's have a listen to that. Now, this is a slight variation on it in that it doesn't actually start on the root. It starts on the perfect fifth and then goes down to the root, but the relationship between the intervals are the same. Listening to that. And there it goes off into something else. But we just get, generally get the same notes there that uh, Superman theme was using here. And let's stop it there. And again, we have that very, very strong relationship. One more example. The theme that uh, Stanley Kubrick, the director, used in 2001 Space Odyssey as the main theme it was by Richard Strauss, also Sprach Zarathustra. Uh, bit of a mouthful, but here it is, very recognizable. So what we really want to focus on is just the first few notes of that. And again, if I just pull it back there a little bit. Uh, a little bit further, here we go. Those are the notes, and that's going from a rouge to a perfect fifth to an octave. Again, very, very strong, and again, as a spacey theme. I'll just play a few more examples of this perfect fifth, and I'm not going to do any kind of commentary on it, and let's see if you can pick them out. Bright copper kettles and so that is just a little piece from my favorite things from Sound and Music. Here is the alphabet song. A, B, C, D. So just that jump from the A, B, that's a perfect fifth. And of course the tune of uh, at the beginning of the alphabet song is really similar to ba, ba, black sheep. Ba, ba, black sheep. Here we get one from the king himself. Wise men say. And so that's going from a root to a perfect fifth back to the root again. And so that's an introduction. Uh, to some of the different songs that uses this root octave, first of all, that uh, relationship, that interval, and also this root perfect fifth uh, interval as well. There's lots of other intervals that have different types of feelings, but for the moment, that's a good start. The very, very strong kind of relationships between those three different types of notes or those three different types of frequencies. And that's exactly what we listen to when we are humans and we're listening to music. We're not listening to the actual notes themselves. We're listening to the differences between the notes, the intervals. That's what gives uh, the song, the melody and the color.